One half of this iconic duo met his best friend on May 12th of 1975 while performing in the Australian version of Jesus Christ Superstar, and they have not missed a beat in their friendship since. The pair went on to sell millions and millions of records worldwide, carried us and our relationships throughout the 70s and the 80s as they showed us what love was really about. These guys are touring now more than ever than they did back in the day, which is totally crazy. Everybody here is the multi-platinum artist who is almost 50 years on stage with us, in front of us, and for all of us, Graham Russell of Air Supply. Graham, thank you. Oh, hi, Kiki. You're very welcome. What a lovely introduction. You're very kind. Oh, well, you're so kind to be doing this for all of us and sharing some really cool stories. Um, I, I just have to say, though, when you first met Russell, did you think, um, my name's Graham Russell and his name is Russell? <laughs> like, did you did you say, listen, there's got to be some type of connection here? There was. I mean, it's not uncommon for people to have the same name, but it was just a, a little bit bizarre at that particular moment, you know. And then we, as we became friends, there was... Uh, so many other things that we had in common, it, we thought it was almost predestined that we worked together. So we we did, you know. I mean, I, I've always been a songwriter, and uh, I'm very aware that I need a great singer. And, you know, Russell is a great singer. And uh, so together we, we create this great team that is, you know, is, is really cool. It's a great way to spend your life, you know. Oh, you are so blessed and so fortunate that you have been able to spend your lives doing what you both love and you're so great at it. It's just so funny because I'm reading your story. You met while you were in Jesus Christ Superstar in Australia and you both had such a love and passion for the Beatles too. Did you ever get to see them together? Uh, no. Uh, well, I saw the Beatles, yeah. Russell saw them in 64 and so did I, but of course, we hadn't met then. I saw them in England. Russell saw them in Melbourne, Australia. But when I saw them, it was very early in their career, and I saw them at my local cinema. I mean, they they were famous at that time, and it was just pandemonium. But it changed my life completely. I thought, oh, yeah, th- this is what I want to do. And, and it made sense to me. So suddenly my life went into gear. And it's just, you you know, the Beatles were such a different sound of music than what you both do. So, and you're a poet, correct? You've been a poet your entire life, I'm assuming. I have, yes, yeah. So to go from, you know, really love-based songs, and then you're seeing the Beatles, you're like, that's what I want to do. And then you really kind of fell back into the love-based songs when you and Russell went out on the road. We did, yeah. I mean, our, our first our first song we put out in Australia went to number one, and nobody knew who we were. We were still in su- in superstar, so we had a lot of luck on our side. Um, but you know, we we've just enjoyed every part of the process of the of this journey that we're still on, and you know, we had no idea. We thought maybe we would last a couple of years. You know, I think any band that's their wish to stay together for a couple of years, but it's been a lifetime. But, you know, it, I think our message is very a very powerful one. It's nothing new, but it's powerful, bringing people together and for people to share share in each other's company and just be, be nice to each other, you know. Absolutely, because we need a lot of that. <laughs> well, we do. I, I think, especially now in the world, where you look around, there's a lot of... Uh, discord and a lot of really weird things going on in every country and i think our message now is more relevant than it ever was i'm i'm thinking you're absolutely right because the people are flocking to air supply we'll talk about that in a minute but (laughs) it's just incredible but going back How did the name Air Supply truly come about? Because I've read so many different stories. You came up with it. Russell came up with it. How did the name happen? Well, it was quite bizarre. I mean, we were in Jesus Christ Superstar, of course, and we had a record coming out, but we didn't have a name. And our record producer said, you've got to come up with something by tomorrow morning because the record needs to go to press. And so Russell and I decided whoever had the the most decent name that wasn't ridiculous, we would go with it the following morning. Well, that night, 
I had this dream and I saw this big billboard and it was pure white and on the perimeter were all these flashing lights going off like kind of like lasers and in the middle in big black letters were two words and it said air supply and I thought hmm that, that's interesting but the dream was so it had such an effect a profound effect on me because I didn't know what it meant. And I told Russell in the morning, I said, I don't have a name, but I had this weird dream. And I saw this air supply name and he said, oh, that's really weird. And uh, But we had to go with it and we said, okay, that's it. And of course, now that name is synonymous with with uh, romantic music around the world. So it was the right name, but it came from a very strange place. That's just crazy. And you know, I I'm I'm digressing a little bit, but I saw a Facebook post of I don't know if it was you or Russell, maybe just the air supply page, put up a picture of a billboard that Don Arden, your previous manager, yeah. had you know, he put you guys on a billboard and you thought that was so cool and here it is, you're talking about how you came up with the name on a yeah. billboard in your dream. So, I don't know. I just had to bring that. I, I had to digress for a minute. <laughs> no, that's a very interesting thought. And Don did, uh, he did put us on a billboard. It was actually on Sunset Boulevard, too, in the very early years. Uh, and he's he's left us now. He passed on, but he was a wonderful person. Uh, you know, Don, Don had a, a reputation for being kind of a hard nut to crack, but he was just a pussycat. He was a wonderful person. Um, but yeah, you know, in our in our career, we've had a lot of luck in our career, and we've had ups and downs. We've had great success, and uh, uh, but we just kind of go with everything. We we don't make any long term plans. Uh, we just kind of go with whatever's going on. Um, if the, if there's a hiccup, oh, we we just jump over it, or we get around it. We never get bogged down with anything negative, and and that that may sound very idyllic, but I think for the kind of music we have, there there really can't be any other way to progress for a band like us. We if we were at each other's throats or fighting all the time, it wouldn't make sense that suddenly we go on stage and we're singing all these beautiful love songs. So we have to be those people too to, in order for it to work, you know. And it definitely worked for the both of you. And the fact that, I don't think it's idyllic at all. I think it's it's just the fact that you both went with it and you kept, and you're still carrying through that idea of non-negativity. It's just the way, really, it's the way everything should be. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, well, I thank you for saying that. Yeah, I mean that's the kind of people we are. We, you know, we look at everything in a positive way, and, and as I said earlier, as, as if anything goes a bit strange, we just sort it out quickly and move on. You know, and that's why, you know, in our friendship, it's it's been really cool. Um, but the, the great thing is, you know, Russell leaves me alone to write the songs and. And, and create the albums and all Russell wants to do is sing which he does a great job of mm -hmm. so our friendship and our relationship in the band is great neither of us want to do the other's job so you know I, I Russell always has first choice at all the new songs and um and I get to write the songs, which is what I've always wanted to be. So it's I live a great life. I mean, I'm in heaven all the time, you know. <laughs> nice. I, I mean, that really, you can't ask for anything else. Now, in 1976, we all think of you guys as a duo, which, which you are. But mm. back in the day, 1976, you had Jeremy Paul with you. So you were three. You started as three. And then when he left... What made you both say, you know what? We're going to just be two now. We're not going to get a third singer. We're just going to be the both of us. Right. Well, Jeremy was a wonderful person. And we had this beautiful three-part harmony, which was just magical. But when, when Rod asked us to go to the U.S. and open for him in North America in 1977, um, well, he asked us in 76 to go in to open for him in 77. Uh, Jeremy said, oh yeah, great. Uh, of course, we, we went. But when we got there, Jeremy was really missing his, his fiance. And he knew he wouldn't see her for like six months. And it, it just wasn't the path he wanted to take. And it was a, with a really heavy heart. He said, guys, I can't do it. I, 
you know, I love the band and everything, but I don't want to give up my my life and and my girl and my fiance for uh, an unknown, you know. And and so he left. And instead of replacing him with anyone, uh, we said, let's just carry on with the two of us because we didn't know anybody that could replace him. Let's just carry on, and which is what we did. Um, and we were. We've always been great friends still with Jeremy, but it, it, it was just one of those things that happened and we moved on and uh, we thought, oh, how are we going to get around this now? But we did, you know, we got around it and when we opened for Rod, it, we had a band, but it was Russell and I that were out front and, and it's been that way ever since. And I guess it falls back into that positive way of thinking and you know what, we're just going to roll with it and whatever happens, happens. Yeah, I mean... We always take the path of least resistance, and uh, it's always worked out for us. However, I mean, there's been times when we've really had to consider things and go, God, this is this is a real hiccup for us. What are we going to do? But we, we get around it, you know. And I think the one thing that we've always had is tenacity. You know, if we get knocked down or... I mean, when we came back from opening for Rod for six months in the U.S., we went back to Australia, and they'd forgotten all about us. And I think a lot of people would have said, oh, well, okay, well, it was a nice journey, but now I'm going to get a real job. But no, we, we got back in the trenches, and we said, no, we're not giving up, because we'd been to the to the U.S., and we wanted to get back here. And so we had to fight and work our way back, and that's exactly what we did. And it took us uh, three years to do that, but we we just weren't giving up. You know, we... We just did anything we could to get back, and we got back in in 1980, and that's when Lost in Love was released. And then after that, everything was uh, a lot easier for us. Now, how did you get on the bill with Rod Stewart? I mean, you guys were brandy new, and, and here it is now. You're going on the road with Rod Stewart. He was on album number eight at that time. How did that all yeah, happen? Um, well, we were we had a big hit record. Our first single was huge in Australia, and Rod came to... Tour Australia, and it was common practice for the the band of the moment uh, to open for an international act. And the union, uh, you had to, it was a union law. They, you had to have a local act. So we were the biggest band in Australia at that time. We were three months old. We had the number one record, and so we opened for Rod uh, after the second show in Adelaide. He came back when we came off, and we just did half an hour. He was in our dressing room and he said, what a great show. And he said, I want you to open for me in North America next year. And we were like, we didn't believe it. We thought he was kidding. Yeah. But he wasn't. And we went. And that's how it happened. But it could have happened to any thousand other bands. But it happened to us. And we were three months old. So we had this thing going for us. We had this incredible look. Uh that was with us and uh, and so we went but when we went and spent six months with him and his party and opening for him we thought oh we're going to break in America too but we didn't it uh, it really brought us back to earth and taught us a lesson of saying no you're not ready yet you've got to work a little harder for this uh, which is what we did and we came back and as I said Australia had forgotten about us and I went away on my own, and I, I wanted to write some songs, a new bunch of songs. And in that, those new songs were All Out of Love, Lost in Love, Chances, and all the other big hits. And I called Russell up and I said, I think I've got some songs that we should record. And uh, Russell, I was uh, 2,000 miles away, and Russell got on a coach, like a Greyhound coach, and came to see me. And... And I played him all the songs on a guitar. And when I played him Lost in Love, he stopped me and he said, that's the one. That's going to be our first big hit. Uh. And he was right. So he picked it. Uh, and then everything everything seemed to get rosier at that point. But we never, we never gave up. We just never gave up at all. We wouldn't even entertain the idea. I literally just got the chills when you said that. He said, that's the song. That's the one. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> and boy, yeah, was he, it ever. It's like that. You know, I'll, I'll, you know, we're actually recording right now. Um, we're in Vancouver for the week to record vocals. 
and when I play him new songs, he'll go, that, that one right there. And uh, <laughs> so he's got a great ear for that, uh, which is great. And that's part of the of his job description, if you like. He can, he can pick them, you know. Well, that's that's and that's a good quality to have. <laughs> Oh, it's great, yeah. Now, after the Rod Tour, though, you, you guys did release your, your third album. And like you said, you know, here it is. You're on this massive, massive high. You're performing in mm. front of hundreds of thousands of people with yeah. Rod Stewart, you know, now now known as Sir Rod. So, y- you know, you're doing all of these wonderful shows and, and you're like, oh, my gosh, we're soaring high. And then, like you said, you, you guys really just got dropped down. I read that, you know, you were going through money or you or Russell were going through money and couches to find change and you know like yeah what we what? were we were looking for money you know there's always a few cents in a couch underneath the cushions <laughs> we were just looking for money to buy a loaf of bread that we could toast we were broke we couldn't even afford to do a show when we came back because we couldn't afford to hire a band or a PA system and in those days we were making two hundred dollars a night for a show. We couldn't afford it, we, so we had to stop touring. And you know, fortunately, somebody somebody signed us from this local record company when when I played them "Lost in Love," and they said, well, "I'm going to sign you." And we said, "Why are you going to sign us?" And th- this guy sort of said something really interesting. I'll never forget it. He said, you did it before with your first big hit and it became a classic. He said, if you did it once, you can do it again. And he said, I think you're going to do it again. And he signed us and that was the beginning. So, you know, in times of uh, doubt and insecurity, there's always been a slither of light for us that we grab hold of or walk towards it's it's always been that way it's never been total darkness so but there's always been something to grab hold of and i think that's a great it's been a great lesson for us there's always a something going on if you look for it and even in lost in love i say lift your eyes if you feel you can so and that really means when you're down and desperate look up to the sky don't keep looking down look up and you'll find some inspiration and you'll find something a thought to grab hold of and i always i've always thought that 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 in lost in love it's a very positive song you know and i think that was one of the reasons why it just took off around the world in 1980 it was so positive and it was the beginning of a decade. It was January 1980. And people, I think, were looking for something else, looking for something new. And there we were. We had this fresh sound. Nobody knew who we were. We, we were a new name. We had this song on the radio. And, and I think all those things added to our uh, to our image at that time. And we were from Australia. They loved that, you know. <laughs> well, it's the accent. You know what I mean? It's, it's just a good it, accent. It is. You know, people would say, God, I love that accent. You know, now they're, they're kind of used to it. But in those days, you know, it, uh, it, it was Olivia Newton-John, Little River Band, right. that came before us. So they were they were ready for some a little bit more of that Australian vibe. And I like to think that when after we arrived, we hopefully made it easier for men at work and in excess to come behind us. So it's we're all on the same team, but we did have a lot going for us because of because we were from Australia and the beach and the sun and the sea. It was all very colorful and summer and positive, you know, in a country in the U.S. where it was January, a new decade. It was kind of dark and gloomy. It was winter. And here we come with all these great fresh thoughts and you know surf and everything <laughs> and you did kind of have the surfer look let's let's go there for a second you did i think we well we we had something going for us yeah and um, i mean we were all starry-eyed i mean suddenly we had this massive hit record and uh, i mean we we were ready for it you know we were broke and it had already been a big hit in japan funnily enough and 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 we went to Japan before we came to the U.S. because they asked us to tour there. And we thought, oh, wow, that's great. You know, our first international uh, tour. And um, so when we, it happened in the U.S., we were kind of, 
not expecting it, but once it started to get played, I remember Russell and I were saying to each other, oh, here it goes, it's going to go, you know. And then, of course, it was all over the radio. You couldn't turn the radio on without hearing Lost in Love in oh, 1980. Absolutely. Anywhere. absolutely, yeah, it's true. But, you know, you, you keep saying you guys, you had that period where you were broke. But here I am, in my mind, thinking, well, you're touring with Rod Stewart. You had to make Ugo Buko Bucks. Yeah. I mean... The, the the thing is, is it's something we've always thought of this. When we were in Superstar and we met, we, we've always thought, as I said earlier, it was predestined. And suddenly we were as green as grass. We didn't know what we were doing. And we met and Russell had worked in an office. I'd been playing in folk clubs with my guitar, uh, earning nothing. And then suddenly we were in Superstar. We had to learn all about theatre and the all the positive things that, uh, that it is to do with theatre, being on time, having respect for the other cast members and the director, listening and learning. Then after that, we went on on tour with the biggest act in the world. It was almost like the universe was saying, okay, you've learned all about theatre now. Now you're going to learn from the biggest act in the world, which we did. We watched his show every single night, and we learned so much. How he controls an audience, what he does, he's funny, and uh, he's, but above all, Rod is always himself. He never tries to be a big pop star or anything like that. He's the, he's the last one to think he's a big pop star. Uh, he, he always wanted to be a soccer player. That's what he wanted to be, a professional soccer player. Right. Right. But uh, that's why he kicks the footballs out at the end of his show. <laughs> but we learned humility and just respect for everybody. And when it was time for us, we had those tricks up our sleeve to use and, uh, you know, be the person we should be and and treat everyone how you want to be treated. You know, that, that's really our philosophy. And, and again, great great philosophy to have because it has clearly worked for you but you know I still see like Lost in Love was still a little bit of a jolt in the road because that was released twice right you you released it in 1979 and then yeah. Clive Davis comes along and he says hey wait a minute we gotta change a couple of these words around and then right to number three <laughs> yeah it was released in 79 in Australia and it was a big hit but we still couldn't tour we couldn't afford to do anything we still couldn't make any more than $200 on the road. And we had a top 10 record. So our our outlook for the future was grim because we, we couldn't do anything. We, If we'd have stayed in Australia, we would have kept having hit records but still not be able to work because we couldn't afford it. So we had to get out. Uh, we had to leave Australia and go to a... We wanted to go back to the US. But when Lost in Love happened, that was the gateway and we said, okay, here we go. And that changed everything for us, you know. And we were ready. We we learned a lot. And and we were ready to headline our own tour, which we did. And um, which la- first tour lasted nine months. But, uh, wow. But, and here we are 50 years later, and we're still doing the same thing. We haven't changed. Well, we've got older, of course. But our philosophy hasn't changed. We, we just want to bring positive feelings to everyone, you know. We can tell, we can feel it from here. Seriously, you can tell. You just, you just a couple of nice guys, you know, basically singing the songs, the soundtrack of our lifetime, you know, for all of us. Yeah. So we can feel it. Trust me. Now, oh, thank you. And that, that's a very nice thing to say. I mean, if we have a legacy at all, it would be that uh, we're bringing positive energy to people and bringing people together and. And it is, a lot of the songs are soundtracks to people's lives and they come to the show and, and then they go, they may go back and go, God, I remember what I was doing. All those things I said I was going to do, but I never did. Now I'm going to do them, you know. So it's kind of a jolt, I think. And it gets people back there and saying, yeah, I, I, was, I fell in love to this song. And people, I mean, scores of people at every show, they say that and they hold they hold placards about fell in love to two less only people or whatever, you know, every song. And yeah. that, that's a great thing for us to bring to the world. You know, it's it's so great. I, I can't imagine the joy you guys get when you perform. Because, I mean, really, you're singing all of these iconic songs night after night. I mean, you're you're selling out shows wherever you go. People are ah, air supplies coming. And, and I have to say, before I go on, I, I'm like, 
all of a sudden, air supply just pops out out of nowhere. I'm like, wait a minute, air supply, what? And and I see you guys are performing everywhere. And I'm going, mm-hmm. what is going on? And were you just kind of shocked recently when you're like, wait a minute, all of a sudden we're just boom, pop popping off again. Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, I mean, there's not a day goes by where I stop and I look out the window and I go, God, this this is really happening. You know, we've been together almost 50 years. We've done almost 5,400 live shows now, which is a lot. Wow. And, and I think to myself, this should have happened to somebody else. Why did it happen to me? Because it was meant to, mm-hmm. and we were the right people. We were in the right place at the right time, uh, which may sound like a simple explanation, but I, I really believe that. It could have happened to anyone, but it happened to us. But you're right. I, I mean, uh, after ne- next week even, we're going to go to... We're going to go to all over Asia, Hong Kong, Singapore, I mean, Indonesia, Malaysia. And then we'll come back, have two weeks for Christmas. And then in in March and April, we have a five-week tour of South America. And we're going everywhere. It's, It's bizarre, you know. And I think, wow, are we are we really doing this? Because this is the dream I always had. I used to dream about this. And and if I saw a band when I was 14 or 15, after I saw the Beatles, I said, God, what a great life that must be, being a professional musician. That's everything. That's utopia. And here I am. I'm living it now. I've been living it for almost 50 years. It's really strange. But what what it says to me, and I really believe this, is that anything is possible if you believe in it and work at it you can do anything and i really believe that if i can do it coming from a working class coal mining town in the middle of england uh, anyone can do it (laughs) and also to say that you guys really could have just quit when you were down and out you could have just said you know what we're not doing this anymore it's not going to work so from that to this you know thankfully you're still here and you decided to not quit but i think a good side gig for you would be doing manifestation videos because clearly you know how to do this you know how to manifest your life (laughs) well i i don't know about that but you know during our show i i and i've done this for years i read a poem you know because one of my poems because I've, I've had a lot of poetry books out and I read a poem and I, when I say I'm, I'm going to read you a few words now you can hear a pin drop in, in the auditorium and it doesn't matter if there's 10 or 20,000 people it goes deadly quiet and I read a few verses of a poem not very long you know it takes me maybe a minute or a minute and a half but people love it and, and I think that's the part that I bring to is just positiveness and saying, okay, guys, don't forget about these things that are in the world that you may have forgotten about, you know, and it's always about a positive, a positive uh, reinforcement. Oh, yeah. And that's and that's absolutely. And and yes, you're absolutely right. And that's why people come to your shows, because they want to get away, you know, from reality for just a few minutes. Now, I have to say, I loved the show Solid Gold. I watch it every single week. And you guys were you know, you kind of became semi-staples there. And I have to say, if there was going to be a third person in air supply, it should have and would have been Dionne Warwick. Because she just, oh, right, yeah. come on. Well, when she yeah, just, I mean, when, you know, I grew up with her music and Burt Bacharach, you know. And when we did that show, and we did it seven, many times, and we met Dionne Warwick, I, I was kind of speechless, you know. Yes. And she was such a lovely person. Yes. And most people are. And I said, you know, Dion, I'm, I grew up with you. I'm standing here talking to you. And uh, it's just wonderful. You know, you meet great people. And everybody on that show in particular was great. Bill Medley was on the Righteous Brothers. Oh, wow. And we became really good friends with uh, Andy Gibb. Oh. And uh, we'd go out to dinner with Andy two or three times. And uh, so we met some great people, you know, you you attract them to you, I think. But Dion Warwick, in particular, was just incredible, iconic lady. You oh, know? for sure. And when she when the songs that she did with you guys on the show, I'm sitting there going, she literally blended with you both perfectly. I know she did. She would have been a great third one, wouldn't she? <laughs> yeah, You're right. I think so. <laughs> 
I really think so. Now, you practically wrote every single song for Air Supply, but one that you didn't write, which became a massive hit, was Making Love Out of Nothing at All. Now, you guys... Yeah. Oh, what a, what a song that is. And you released it in 1983. It went to number two. Then Bonnie Tyler comes along in 95. And ironically, her number one song, Totally Clips of the Heart, kept you both from hitting number one. Now, Jim Jim Steinman offered both Making Love Not Out of Nothing at All and Total Eclipse of the Heart to Meatloaf, but they couldn't come to some financial agreement. So how did Air Supply flow into getting that song? Right. Well, it, we had the greatest hits coming out, and Russell and I kind of fought Clive Davis on it. He said, I'm going to bring out the greatest hits. And we said, it's too early. We'd only had two albums out. And he says, no, it's the right time. But he said, he said, I've got this song because he was good friends with Jim Steinman. And he said, I want you to listen to this song. Um, And we listened to it. And of course, it was an instant. Yes. We said, yeah, of course. Now, I've always thought that Russell should sing other people's songs because he's one of the great singers of our generation. He shouldn't just sing my songs. And I, I said, oh, we've got to do this song. It was really long. It was like seven minutes long. So I said to Clive, you know, can we cut it down? He says, well, you got better talk to Jim. So we called Jim and we got together with him. And we, we met him at Rumpelmeyer's in New York City. It's an ice cream shop. And we sat and had ice cream with him. <laughs> and so we, he agreed to cut it down. And, and he agreed to, to produce the song. And uh, we thought, oh, fantastic, because it was very different for us. And Clive was very shrewd about that. It was totally different for us. And it was, you know, all Jim's songs are very meatloafy, if you know what I mean. I do. Now, I do. I, I've always been a meatloaf fan, too. Yes. In, earlier on, big meatloaf fan. And I thought, well, with Jim, he's one of the greatest songwriters than the, of our generation, you know, he's gone now, unfortunately. But he's a he's a brilliant songwriter, and um, I thought, what a thrill and a, an honor to record one of his songs. And of course, it was huge. But you're right. Um, and I called him when we went to number two. I said, Jim, we've gone to number two. He said, Yeah. He said, I don't think yeah, I don't think you're going to go to number one either because yeah, his other <laughs> song was already at number one by Bonnie Tyler. So here's Jim. He had the number one and the number two song all around the world and and it was fantastic but he was once again he was a wonderful person he always looked a bit strange you know uh in his leather gloves and everything but he was wonderful he was a real sweetheart and um, we you know we got in the studio we recorded everything in in one day russell sang the song first take i'll never forget i was sitting next to jim when russell had got a level on the vocal and Jim said, okay, let's, let's run the song. And Russell sang it top to bottom. And Jim turned to me and he said, that was really good. I said, yeah, it was. And he said, I think we've got it. And I said, yeah, I think we've got it too. And that was it. It was one take. Such, oh and we God. walked away and that was it. One take and such a powerful, powerful song from you guys. Now, did you ever perform it with Bonnie? No, we never did. You know, I'd never met Bonnie. Oh, Come on. Maybe I met her. I may have met her on Solid Gold. I can't remember. But that would have been fantastic, actually. Uh, funnily enough, you know, a good friend of ours is, uh, she's opening for, oh, God, no, uh, <laughs> Michael Bolton, who, who we played the Hollywood Bowl with in September. And he's playing the O2 in London, and, and opening for him is Bonnie Tyler. So she's definitely still around, you know. Oh, she is. And I mean, that would be a really crazy thing. Wouldn't that be cool? Uh, yeah. yeah, it would be beyond cool. I mean, you guys and Bonnie, because I hear you guys singing it, but then my other side of the brain, you know, of course, I can hear Bonnie singing it too. So to bring oh, yeah. all of you together to sing it today, 2023, yeah. 2024, oh my gosh, it would be, it would be yeah, iconic. I know. That's a great idea, actually. I should see if she's... I think she lives in England still, but I can, I can find out. Okay, so we can make a pact right now. If it happens, I get to come to that show. 
Oh, all right. I'll make sure you do. <laughs> Wouldn't that be great? Oh, Mike, I, it would be. People would be crying. I'm. I'm serious. I. I would be crying. Like to to yeah. see oh, all my. three of you. It would. Yeah. It would be so powerful. It'd be crazy. Now another song you did not write, but definitely where I said to myself, "Oh my gosh, I remember them singing this song," but I totally forgot about it. If that makes any sense, but power of love you are my lady really like i i totally forgot about that one and yeah we we used to we used to well it came to us from our producer at the time uh and we were recording in england and he said i've got this song it's just a demo and it wasn't even released and it was jennifer rush and she'd done this demo of this song called power of love and of course, Russell loved it straight away, and so did I. And I thought, oh, wow, this is something else. Once again, it was very different for us, very kind of techno. And and we got a little deeper into it and said, well, if we do it, we want to make sure nobody else is going to release it. Um, and Jennifer Rush said, yeah, she wouldn't do that. So anyway, we record it, and we release it, and then she releases her demo the original version and it and it becomes the her version becomes the biggest song one of the biggest songs ever in england so it just swallowed ours up completely because we didn't have a real image in england at that time so we lost out on that so we we said because of that we're not going to play it live and we didn't play it for 20 years then we started to play it and celine dion recorded it and maria carey recorded it so then we stopped playing it so we we haven't played it for years and i don't know if we would anymore you know really yeah you you so why wouldn't you play it though uh because everybody else has recorded it i think okay i know the late laura Branigan did as well Oh, did she do it? Oh, wow, there you go, yeah. She did. But, but, I mean, that just tells you it's a great song. Uh, You know, I mean, we we play without you. uh, It's our next to last song, simply because it's uh, just an incredible song. So maybe I should take that back. Maybe we would play it again, you know. Because it is such an icon. I mean, really. Yes. Oh, it's it's one of the greatest songs ever. It really is. I mean, we think of Celine. You know, we love Celine, but we also think of Air Supply and to hear Air Supply singing that again. I mean, because you did do it. So, and, and oh, yeah. And our, I thought our version was the best one ever. Of course. But that's just, that's just, I'm biased, you of, know. Of course. But, you know, you also on that single with you were the guys from, some of the guys from Toto. You had David Page and Steve Picaro and Steve Lukather. So, yeah. h- how did they get wrapped up in that record? Uh, well, they they were all kind of in in L.A. Uh, at, that, at that time. And, um, you know, I, I knew all those guys. I knew a lot of people, a lot of the, they were all, a lot of, they were heavy session guys at that point, too, even though they were in Toto. They would do all the sessions in town. So I already knew them, and um, I think they just played on it, you know. Now, in 81, you got, your life was full. <laughs> 79 through 81, you had already had a lot of fullness going on, but then you got your number one hit, the one that you love, and that is still one of your biggest hits. What did you feel like? What was the feeling that came over you guys when you said, oh my gosh, we are at number one right now? What, what was that day like for you? Um, I remember it. We, we had a show somewhere and we found out in the afternoon so we came to sound check and we told everybody because we would get the numbers a week in advance. Uh, we were just elated. We were on cloud nine. You know, we we wanted a number one and we come close several times early with the previous album. Um, but also I think, you know, people expect a second album from a lot of artists to fail. Um, but we didn't. We came out and the first song went to number one. So I think it really cemented our popularity and our um, image for for a long time for the future you know uh plus it's a great i'm not saying because i wrote the song but it's a great song and um you know once again russell sang it first take and it just added to our uh, to our arsenal you know it really did and uh wow well, i don't know what we'd do without that song it was it was just came at the right time but and having a number one means 
so much to us. It's all right having a few number twos and number threes, but if you have a number one song in the world, then it's some, it's something else. You oh, know? Yeah. People it, never forget that. You're in the golden box, for sure. Your catalog of songs are just... I mean, it's it's insane, everything that you've written yeah. and, and Russell has sang for everybody. Now, do you remember in 1982 at the American Music Awards, you weren't there, you were there through satellite feed, but you weren't there. You, you won the award for mm. favorite pop group. But what happened? Do you remember what happened? Why the feed didn't even happen? Like you couldn't even accept it on camera anyway. Right. Yeah, we were waiting for it and we were playing live by by the Harbour Bridge in Sydney and we were all ready to go and it just it just went dead and it was a real uh, shame for us because we were we were very happy and very proud to take that award you know because uh, in those days we didn't get many awards but uh, what can you do it just the feed went down and we just just packed up and, and left and went went home dang <laughs> it was dang. weird <laughs> yeah and MTV like I I don't recall seeing many videos or any videos from you guys on MTV, but VH1, yeah, MTV, like, what happened there? MTV ne- never played us, ever, not one time. I think they wanted to be associated with more heavier bands and bands that were really cool, uh, you know, like Dire Straits and, and The Police, things like that, and we didn't fit into that category. They never, ever played us. We played down, we got played on vh1 which was the like mtv light right in fact we had a video of the year pretty much every year but they never played us on mtv i don't think they wanted our image associated with with them you know well i like rolling stone we've never had an article in rolling stone that's crazy ever crazy listen to this when we had the number one the one that you love rolling stone didn't publish it they (laughs) left it out we weren't we weren't cool enough to be number one in Rolling Stone because it was a you know a, a kind of a left left of center magazine and we didn't fall into that well uh, which is fine we didn't care you know <laughs> you know what I think you guys are really cool so it doesn't matter <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we don't care. We're still here. <laughs> that that's right. Now after the 80s though what did, did you guys like maybe even think you know what maybe we should take a break because I don't think you ever did. Did you? No, we didn't. I mean, in Billboard, it said, oh, we split up and then came back together. But we never broke up. I don't know where they get they got that from. Um, no, we've we've always played. We've always worked. We went when they thought we'd split up. We went to to China and Vietnam. We wanted to go to some places that nobody had been before. And, um, you know, we were the first band in China to tour China and Taiwan and a lot of uh, Asian uh, countries and um, even weird places in South America that nobody had ever heard of. We went down there and played, you know, and and it was wonderful. It was great. It was a great awakening for us. Now, you guys have given us love song after love song after love song, but you have your own love story. You and your wife, Jody have been together for 40 years plot probably more than that so she's been there for you she's been there with you through the ups and you know everything really so is it true that you both met at a show and how did that happen yeah we met at a show in 1983 uh in rockford illinois she was there with her mother and she was actually 16 years old and we met but and then after that We never went on a date or anything. We just wrote to each other for another two years. And I didn't see her for two years. And then uh, they were looking for someone for the Making Love uh, Add Nothing At All video. Actually, no, we met in 81, I'm correcting. And the video was 83. And they couldn't find anybody. And they said, do you know anybody? I said, well, I know this young girl in in Illinois, in Rockford. and, And I showed them a picture. And they went, okay. We're going to get hold of her and see if she's interested. Of course, she was. So they flew her out, and and we made the video, and we fell in love making the video, and oh. and she never went home. <laughs> <laughs> that is much, so cute. Much to the the uh, uh, dad was a little a little dark for a while, but he 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 was he was really cool. He was a great guy. Oh, I mean, because really, you know, here it is. You tell everybody about how to, you know 
love, 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 how to be in love. This is love. And you are living your love story, which is just completely amazing. Yeah, absolutely. It's like I said earlier, you have to, you have to practice what you preach. You know, you can't, I can't say one thing and do another. That wouldn't be right. It wouldn't be, uh, it's not me at all. So, you know, it's all about love for us, for Russell too. And um, that's the way we live life, you know. All you need is love, just like the Beatles said. No. That's right. That's, that's the song we play right at the end of our show. Do you and really? We finished. <laughs> I had no idea. No, Graham, a long time ago, you said that you always had a purpose and were always trying to climb up the ladder of creating another song. Are you still climbing that ladder or are you focused on today just playing the iconic hits for your fans every single time you go out? Oh, no, I write every single day and... As I said, we're we're recording our new album. We're in the middle of it. We're doing vocals right now. So, and it'll be finished by, uh, I think, June next year. Uh, and it's it's certainly our finest album we've ever made. And we haven't made one for fourteen years because we didn't we didn't know if we would make another one. But we said, yeah, let's do it. So we're in the middle of it now. But yeah, I've uh, I mean, I've written nine musicals and wow. you know twenty five albums for Air Supply. So I'm. I work all the time. Well, we'll be pretty excited to hear that new album. So please keep us posted on that. And you and Russell, you've had really, you've you've kept up a clean image for all of these decades, almost 50 years worth. And you both have said you've never had an argument, which, you know, it's true. It it really is rare in the music business because you're always hearing stories about something or another. And Air Supply today is bigger than ever. You're selling out venues wherever you go. And fans are just so grateful for you guys, you know, being out there doing what you do. What is the crazy, like there has to be something crazy that you guys did back in the day that really kind of went against the grain a little bit. Can you share that with us? You know, I don't think there really is anything. The thing is, we were so happy to be where we were when, uh, you know, even throughout the 80s and 90s, we thought, oh God, how long is this going to last? But now now we realize that it's a, a lifetime journey that we're on. And, you know, we'll never get to retire, not that we want to. Um, you know, Russell and I said, we'll stop playing when the people stop coming. And that's, I can't see that happening for, for a long time. Uh, but there's never been anything really crazy, you know, anything like that has been good for us. You know, I, I, on the positive side, you know, I, I had lunch with Princess Diana and Prince Charles in 1988, which was, uh, that's the crazy thing, uh, the, the craziest thing, but not dodgy crazy or weird, but just really amazing. You know, right, right. having lunch with the, the future King of England was, was something else. Yeah. I mean, like, was he cool? <laughs> you know, oh, they were both fantastic. Yeah. I mean, she seemed you know, like we a beautiful were there person doing a command performance in Australia. And, and there was a luncheon the next day, but Russell didn't make it because he had a hangover. Oh no. And so, it, you know, I just, I went and it was, uh, the royal couple, and uh, there was the, uh, a judge, the Australia's highest Supreme Court judge was there, who got terribly drunk. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, But it was wonderful, you know. I mean, being able to talk much like I'm talking to you now, and but I'll, you know, it's to Prince Charles and Lady uh, Princess Diana, who was probably the most amazing woman I've ever met. Oh, you know, I, w- I would definitely feel that. Now, did you ever keep in touch with her after you had met? No, no. You you weren't allowed to, to talk on that, you know, to even say, hey, can I have your phone number or, or can we, can I keep in touch? No, that wasn't allowed, you know. You wow. had to, you really, if they would start a conversation and you could carry it on. Um, but there was, there was protocols that, you know, if they, if they get up, you stand up or, and, uh, but you know, it was, it was very normal, you know, oh, it's, excuse me, uh, your highness, can you, can you pass me the salt <laughs> and things like that? You know what I mean? It's kind of really weird. <laughs> <laughs> so on that note, who was the biggest artist that you both had met that really made you speechless? Um, well, I've you know we're big Beatles fans. Um, I've met Ringo, mm-hmm. which, which was 
you know, meeting a Beatle is the biggest thrill of all. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, I, I, I'm a big Sting fan, and I met Sting, and oh, Peter wow. Gabriel, I love his music, of course, everyone does. Oh, yeah. Uh, but we don't get to meet that many people. Uh, you know, we both live uh, uh, a life that's not in, not in that uh, uh, circle, if you like. Once we're at home and not on the road, we're kind of different people well we're the same people but we're back doing what normal people do you know i live on i live on a ranch so i'm moving bales of hay and i have a big garden and a greenhouse and dogs and cats and all kinds of stuff so it keeps me very well balanced oh absolutely especially taking care of animals my goodness that's a lot of work yeah yeah (laughs) so what is the biggest lesson after almost 50 years of you being with your best friend being on the road what is the biggest lesson you have taken away with and still carry with you from being in one of the most iconic bands ever oh you're you're very kind i think well i always if anybody asks me for advice i always say uh, believe in yourself and do what you love to do uh, if if you and I'm, I this phrase is not mine. I just follow it. Uh, if you if you do what you love to do, you'll never work a day in your life, and that's what we do. We never work. We just love doing what we do, and you know, even traveling all over the place all the time. Uh, it's part of it's part of the job that we love, and we wouldn't change it for anything. And. Uh, you know, do what you love. I'm so lucky to be able to do this because I always wanted to be a professional songwriter and here, here I am and I'm doing that and living the life I always wanted. And and it's it's available to everybody and anybody. You know, it nothing is impossible. Such an inspirational conversation today, Graham. I, I am so thankful that I had this opportunity to speak with you because really, I think you th- this conversation is going to touch so many people and I think you're going to make a lot of people smile with this story, oh, I hope so. it, really. And it's just great. And I, I'm really, really grateful. You know, it, again, you hear this all the time, but I listened to you growing up and I, I know, like I said, just, just a line you hear all the time, but truly to be able to speak with you, I, I just feel so blessed and I, I, I really can't give you any more words than that. I feel very, very blessed that you're here today talking with me, little old teeny me and being able to share. <laughs> oh, you're these- so kind, Kiki. <laughs> I mean, it's my pleasure. Absolutely. Thank you so much. You've, that's just such a beautiful thing to say. And, I would do it at any moment at any, of any day. It's wonderful to be speaking with you. Well, we wish very, very many great blessings to you. Cheers to you, Graham, and to Russell, and to the air supply community. We love you for what you do, and we thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you so much, Kiki. I, you, I, you've got me uh, stuck for words. Thank you so much. Oh, we appreciate it. <laughs>